Welcome to Elixir Wizards, a podcast brought to you by Smart Logic, a custom web and mobile development shop based in Baltimore. My name is Justice Eepin, and I'll be your host today. I'm joined by my co-host, Eric Ostrich. Hi, Eric. Hello. And this season, we're talking about system and application architecture, and today's guest is none other than Amos Lee King, the Elixir Outlaw. How are you, buddy? I feel like I just got invited into a boxing ring with that announce announcer right there. That's good. Well, this sometimes can get pretty pretty violent in here, Amos. <laughs> we'll try to keep that down. I don't want to have to hit anybody. Are, are you ready to rumble? <laughs> Ooh, could, just be careful how you say that. <laughs> It's copyrighted. <laughs> copyrighted. Is Amos ready to rumble? What does Adcron mean, Amos? So, <laughs> and also, can you spell it for it's the guests? It's A-D-K-R-O-N. This is pretty funny, actually. And and I, I debated whenever you told me you were going to ask me this, being like, why, why are you going to waste your time on that? But then I thought it was very pertinent because, you know, Eric is into MUDs. And I would say I'm into muds i'm gonna say still yeah i like muds they're they're fun i grew up playing muds you know back whenever the only multiplayer games had to be text because you couldn't send anything else over that bit rate and i had to come up with a name the first mud i ever played so i was like 11 and i looked over at a clock and i rearranged the letters on the clock and i don't know if i changed or added a few and that's ad crime <laughs> And I've used it ever since. <laughs> yeah, you were hoping for something better, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's perfect. I also, this is not on our outline, but I'm curious how you guys came up with the name Elixir Outlaws. So that actually is pretty good. A lot of people come up to us and they're like, oh, you you guys listened to Ruby Rogues back in the day. So that's where Elixir Outlaws came from. And I was like, well, why wouldn't we have something with alliteration if we were going to do that? But I love the, the Ruby Rogues back in the day. I spent a lot of time listening to James Edward Gray talking there. And so don't get me wrong, like mad respect for those guys, but that's not where it came from. So Chris, Anna, and I were in Colorado for Elixir Days. And we were talking about having a podcast, maybe maybe join in uh, Johnny Wynn on his podcast, Elixir Fountain. And... When we were there, just a lot of the conversations we were having, Johnny Wynn actually called us outlaws because of the things we talk about and and that we didn't talk about the same things as the other people in the, I guess, larger community. And some of those, like like we were getting into nitty details and, and how to design stuff and maybe didn't necessarily agree with everybody in the, in the larger community at the time. And so he called us outlaws. And... And I don't know, four months later is when we started the podcast. And so it stuck. What were you like? What were you talking about that was so transgressive and against the wall? I don't remember. I mean, I can tell you, like, after we started the podcast, I, you know, live view might be one of those. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I think we none of us are like really against live view. It was just funny. Like we would talk about things like, well, everybody's talking about live view. Let's talk about something different kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot of it. It wasn't necessarily that we were like, oh gosh, everybody's stupid. But although that would be wrong, right? Stupid is a strong word, but <laughs> no, probably would not be wrong. You don't strike me as a missing <laughs> I <bro>. hope not. <laughs> All right. So I guess rolling forward a little bit from your mud days, how did you get into programming? Were you formally tr- pro- uh, trained and yes and no. Okay. So my mud days actually is probably what got me into wanting to program a little bit. I was like, man, I, I want to make one of these. Like everybody's building one, but I, you know, I didn't really have internet that we would call internet today. And my family weren't people that necessarily knew about like the boards and stuff that you could get to and, and have that community and learn from. So I don't even remember how I found out about muds. So I, taught myself to program. I originally found QBasic on my Windows 311 machine, I think. And it had all the documentation in it. And I sat down and I read all of the documentation. And then I started making little games on there. And that led into, in junior high, I got my first TI-85 calculator, graphing calculator. And um, 
started playing with programming in there where like a lot of the kids were making little programs that did their math for them. I was making games and would sell it to people at school for five bucks. I'd transfer it to their TIs and then I would charge them like a buck if they already had it, but I had improved the game somehow. So I I got paid for updates. A lot of people also got it for free. And then once you were transferring it around, like all software in that era, it just got pirated and everybody suddenly had it at school. So it wasn't much of a moneymaker for me. And then when I was a junior in high school, I actually wanted to be a trauma surgeon. And I went to a semester in the summer. There was a program at St. Louis University for kids whose parents hadn't been to college, but those kids looked like they were going to go. And when I told them that I wanted to be a doctor, they put me in a biology class and, and allowed me to um, dissect cadavers. And one of them was a young man uh, under 18. And I was like, man, as a trauma surgeon, people are probably going to be dying around me a lot. And I don't think I ever want to be in a position to tell a parent that their kid just passed away or is going to in a short period mm-hmm. of time. I didn't mean to take it morbid. Um, <laughs> and and so, and I also wanted to have a family and, and learned through that whole thing that trauma surgeons are always on call and, and never around. And I never thought about programming as an actual job, even though I did make some money off of it. I it, it was just something I did for fun. So then I wanted to build roller coasters. And when I got out of high school, I was going to go to University of Missouri Rolla for civil engineering and build roller coasters. And I found out that that's a really hard field to get into. Before I even started school, I found that out. And so I was, I, I was still looking and still wanted to go to school because I enjoyed learning and thought, man, why don't I just turn this programming thing? Like, you know, it was like right around, I started college in 99. So it was right around the Y2K bug. So programmers were making a ton of money and they were in high demand. And I thought this could be work. And so, so then I, I started a career in that. It took me 99 to 2006 because I also joined the Air National Guard and was gone to the Middle East and uh, a few other places during that time. So, so it took me seven years to graduate, but I was gone a lot too. And I think that actually helped me get some focus toward the end of my university career and really sink in on those high level classes. And so that has driven me since then to enjoy reading white papers. And a lot of those senior classes are based on like software design is what they called it, but it was more like uh, agile or waterfall and thing of the software processes. And I started really getting into that stuff too and reading a ton just reading all the time. I didn't realize how much I read though, because a lot of it was blogs, and not books. So I'm wondering what that first opportunity looked like. Which one? Like we're like getting paid as an adult. Like what what were you doing, and like how did you how did you stumble into it? Oh, that takes us back to the story that we were talking about before we actually got on here. So I was working in a donut shop called Donut King in college. This is like the best job for a college student. I worked from noon to 7 p.m. on weekends only, Saturday and Sunday. Nobody comes into the donut shop, uh, like very few people. And they're usually college students that are coming in after they got out of bed. And at 7 p.m., you still have plenty of time to go party afterwards or whatever you want to do. And so I sat in there and did homework and... There was a, a man who owned a company called USA Express, and they transported people to, like, to and from the airport along Interstate 44 in Missouri. And um, they had some, they had had another student from the university build a system for their dispatcher, and it had a bug in it, and they needed some more work. And he, he said, you know, if you want, you can come work for me part time being a programmer. And I said, okay. And I still worked at the donut shop on the weekend. And then I worked for him during the week and, and started working there. And then when I was working there, actually, one of the people that they picked up was uh, Wally Amos, famous Amos cookies from uh, Lambert airport in St. Louis. And he, he's a motivational speaker at the time. And so this was before the cookie company or did he have a cookie company? No, this is, this is way, at, way after the cookie. And then company. he becomes a football motivation. I'm, I'm not that old. <laughs> Yeah, he became. A, well, you're talking a, about Windows a, three, a and I had to look up when life. Windows three happened, and it was like before I was born. So, oh god! But just by a few months, it wasn't like <laughs> long before I was born. Okay. Just a few months before I was born. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Famous Sam so is I'm, like, I'm only I'm only like ten years <laughs> older than you. Then that's that's okay. <laughs> so I got I got to meet famous Amos because they were they were driving around. Apparently they were talking about Amos in in the office, and he's like, oh, I got to meet him, and they were going to pass the office. So so he came in and said hello. It was like a five minute meeting. It wasn't much of anything. I did tell him that his cookies were too hard for my liking. <laughs> They're what pretty did, good they say? if you know if you if you wet them down with milk for a while, and he's like, "Well, that's the best way to eat them anyway." So <laughs> sounds like a good. So sport. maybe maybe they were purposely too hard so that you have to use them with milk. Maybe I think they they probably last longer on a shelf life at that point too. That was my first, I guess, official programming gig. You remember I, how much I you got made paid? some money here and there? I think like ten dollars an wow. hour, maybe. Because it wasn't it wasn't for the project. They actually just had me become an employee. Hmm. And I worked there for, I don't know, about six or eight months. And then they they sold to another company. And so I, did, I didn't hmm. stay on. I think that's a common theme with people in this industry where they start out in like a really low paying kind of role. Is that right? So, well, I had no experience and I was like a student. So, yeah, they looked at me as like an intern kind of. But I, th- I think that that's generally generally true. One of my first internships, I guess, was working for a professor to like re-up their Eclipse plugin. And I remember being super stoked for $10 an hour. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll just join the party here. My first programming job, I got paid 28 grand a year which was actually less than the job I'd come from making like 30. <laughs> so I, I got paid roughly that part-time in college at a U.S. geological survey because my military experience, I started at a higher rate of pay than all the other student developers. <laughs> nice. By the way, thank you for your and service. Then, oh, I, I loved it. I did it for 13 years. Wow. So, I, you know, you got to love it. I did 12 and they were told me every 18 months I was going to be gone for six. And at that point I had already been gone a lot and I had three kids and said, you know, I think I'm done. And they extended me a year in order to try to talk me into staying. I miss it sometimes, Mm -hmm. but I loved working in the military. I did electronics though. I fixed radios and, and satellite antennas and things like that. You know, pulling out the soldering gun and the spectrum analyzer. I still try to do that a little bit with the nerve stuff. My spectrum analyzer skills are not near as good as they used to be. I can tell you that if that all that equipment and stuff and and my soldering is not as good. If you don't use that, you lose it. I can solder things on really well. It's taking them off. It's hard for people like me who don't know anything. What is a spectrum analyzer? So now I have one that is like fits in this little bag that I can slide in my pocket. But the one that I had in the military was table sized. And I think if you, have you ever seen in a movie where you have like a little ray tube on a big machine and and it's got like a sine wave going Mm -hmm. across it, that is a spectrum analyzer. And what you can do with that is that's looking at the actual voltage. You can look at square waves. So digital is square waves on there and everything with you can adjust timing and and stuff and you hook these little probes on to different points on like your motherboard in order to look at the signal going through and you can trace the signal through the system and depending on where you are in the system if you see that the signal is not what you expect it to be you can start to eliminate which part of the system probably has a problem and maybe find find a capacitor or resistor that's broke or a chip that needs to be replaced. Okay, I've seen this being done before at Pavlock, but I just didn't know that's what it was. Cool. You can also use it to try to figure out what's going on in your electronics so you can make them do different things. Cool. We're gonna have to do we're gonna have to do a whole episode on uh on nerve stuff, I think, with like video. You should get Connor and, and Hunleth in here. Ooh, ooh, that would be a really cool. Episode. Hunleth probably has some really fantastic spectrum analyzer skills. He's got an amazing workbench. Maybe you, you could just do a whole episode where he gives you a tour of his workbench. You no, know, should I? Should, I'm gonna. That would be amazing. I'll tell you now, Amos. Next week we're doing a Council of Wizards live show. Oh, wait, you're yeah, nice. Okay. No, I'm not invited. I saw that look <laughs> in your face. Well, because <laughs> we invited. Uh, who did we invite, Eric? We've got a few people yeah. coming. You were, you guys were on the last one. You're on the last between us. So we're, the between us <laughs> is now becoming the council of, of, of wizards. And we're going to do some live shows every now and then, nice. but where was I going with this? Oh, that we should do a whole live episode with just like hardware oriented people where we can talk about this stuff. And because it has video, so we get a video and that would be cool. I think it's a good idea. 
you could get Residec to come in and and video his home sprinkler system that he built using mm, herbs. That's a good idea. Yeah, in action. Yeah, because of my sprinkler, I'm about to replace with whatever yeah. he built. Uh, yeah, because Drizzle, he he just made it into a GitHub org and all that. Really? Yeah. So he'd probably be excited to come. Show that's you cool. That. I'm about to replace mine because at least I can work on that. Like the old one is is like I'm like an old person with a VCR. I have no idea how to even turn it on. It's obnoxious. Yeah, it's weird being in technology and not understanding technology. You know, like I have this problem all the time. Like my my mom will be like, "Can you help me with uh, Facebook?" I'm like, "No." <laughs> No. Can you help me with Facebook? Uh, what's your favorite underrated Elixir resource? Ah, that's hard. You can also pick your favorite overrated Elixir resource. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm gonna say it. I I say it over and over again. Steve Bussey's book, I think, is is amazing. If anybody's wanting to do Phoenix and find the real power of Phoenix, I believe that the real power of Phoenix is in its real time stuff, and I think that is a fantastic resource. I do believe that you should know a little bit of Elixir and Phoenix and a little OTP beforehand. Uh, I really like that. Is that just because you have a quote on the book? <laughs> no, that's why I, I I gave him that quote. I, it was pretty awesome that it's on the cover too. Like that's amazing. Well, the back cover, they didn't, they didn't put me on the front. I tried them to put, get them to put Steve Bussey's name on the back and oh. just my quote on the front, but it, it was, it was not going to work out uh, next time. Next time. Have you written any <laughs> books, Amos? I have not written. So wait, you're books. telling me you've got a blurb you know, I, on a book, but you haven't written one. No, I th- is that called winning? Yeah, it's called winning. <laughs> what are they going to ask me for a blurb? You know what? When they ask me, f- I'm going to say no, few, just to spite them. I, I got a few of them on books. Here's what you do. You find somebody who's an author or, or is like making a book and, and you offer to review their book mm. as a technical reviewer. And once you're in, Prag Prague will send you an email every time there's a new book. And they're like, you want to read this? You want to read this? Do you know anyone that's currently writing a book? Yes. Can you? All right. Just send it to me and I'll, I'll, I'll hit them up. Yeah. I don't know that I can say it because then if they don't finish the book for some reason, <laughs> then that's just no. And writing a book is hard. That's why I've, I've, I've started like four times. Yeah. By the time I get done with the like layout of, of the index, I'm like, nah, mm, I'm done. <laughs> Table of contents, not the index. <laughs> yeah, plus writing, writing. it'll be referred to as the highly anticipated new book from whoever, and they'll have just such a higher bar. To <laughs> now, is this is this uh, Martin Gosby's Elixir in action? <laughs> <laughs> like in action? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Justice and I are just like jokes are always better explained. I keep trying to tell Keithley that, but. He's not listening. No, they are better explained because the explanation itself is a joke. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you could just keep going. It's reductio ad absurdum. It is It is the height of comedy. It's the opposite of sarcasm, which is the highest form of comedy, I think. You think it's sarcasm? Oh, see. No, I think sarcasm I, is the lowest form of comedy, oh, but the okay. opposite would be the highest form. I'm going to play that. I'm going to play that sound clip right there for my son. Like while he sleeps just all night long on repeat. Oh, is he, is he like the lowest middle school age? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no. So I, I, it's it, highly disturbing to me that the culture has shifted so far in the direction of sarcasm being really the only form of comedy. And it's so low and cheap and easy that I just, I, I hate it. And I'll tell anybody anytime your sarcasm is weak sauce. So I, our, I think it destroys, destroy, destroys relationships on teams too. Not like you can have a great relationship and it just takes somebody having a bad day and one sarcastic comment and uh-huh. you can tear away a year's worth of like growth in a friendship in moments. Mm, mm. We got real serious here. Where do yeah. where do uh, puns sit in this? Uh, <laughs> higher puns are brilliant. <laughs> P- puns <laughs> transcend joke. Yeah, like they're not even on the scale because they're just so much higher than jokes. It's just they are like an entirely different form of art. They actually are art artistic purity in its like most like distilled form. That's why those middle-aged kids that are all into sarcasm, every time you say a pun, they just roll their eyes and don't laugh. It's right. Because when you're, when you're a middle teen kid, you, just, you don't, you don't get true art. Yeah. They don't get that. You're kidding. Yeah. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> okay. Let's knock it off. <laughs> 
uh, we're going to cut this whole episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh man, I loved being on your show, the live show that we did at uh, Lone Star. Actually, you're wearing the shirt. I thought I'd mention that. I, I wore it today just because you guys were there. So mm-hmm. I heard that you and Eric paired on something last week. How did it go? What were you working on? I had a great time. I'm gonna let Eric pronounce it because I'll I'll screw it up. I thought like a like kale lettuce or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's the Kalevala. So it's just each syllable or each two letters is its own syllable oh i can do this now call yep. all right a mud engine i would call it an engine mm-hmm. and we added some functionality to uh allow you to define some of the ai of the non-player characters in separate files from the player characters and then that also allows you to reuse the ai with different characters he even made me a character for a little bit really yeah, yeah, there was an Amos villager. So what happened to him? I think he only had one hit point. I don't know. Uh, yeah, was, <laughs> <laughs> I forget exactly. I think we just copy pasted it to show that because Amos was asking about stuff and then I just like was like, oh, yeah, you can define multiples and copy pasted one of the villagers and renamed it Amos. And I was like, and now you're in the game. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, how did it how did it like were you guys like on the Slack channel, talking back and forth. I, I, the reason I want to dig into this is because this is one thing that the Elixir community is great at is just this like off the cuff, let's help each other out. Um, I'm pretty I'm, sure doesn't like, wasn't Justin like trading work with someone else, like his job work with someone else. Anyway, go I on. have no idea. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Justin <laughs> Schneck and like, and like a couple other people were basically like trading their j- works, like their real work with each other. Oh, well, I can see that. Yeah, which is totally uh, valid. I mean, I'm not. I mean, as long as your company is okay with it. And if they're not, as long as you can be very sneaky. <laughs> so I'm pushy, basically. I saw Eric tweeting about working on it. And so I just messaged him and was like, hey, my wife and daughters are gone. So I'm at home with just the boys and they're teenagers. So we don't talk. And I'm going to have a lot of free time. Would you like to pair? <laughs> and it was it was on the Elixir Slack. Did I ping you? Yeah, Twitter, remember. but I, or Twitter, yeah. Okay, yeah. The Elixir Slack for anyone listening is top notch resource, and so is Twitter. Yeah. So and it was going well. You're doing some AI stuff. We're going to talk a little bit about AI. And well, I don't know that. I don't know. That I would say we did a lot of AI <laughs> work. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of like the first half was just kind of showing off the code base and answering questions and and whatnot and then we and also just uh like bsing and whatnot <laughs> and so like then the last half like oh i guess we should do something we said we were going to pair and so then that's what we worked on because the behavior trees is what i ended up using for the simple ai for these characters it's so verbose that like the files that they're in just were like hundreds of lines long and part of the goal of a behavior tree is that you can compose them. So being able to reference specific parts of a tree and then merge them in is, is kind of where, or where I, yeah, where I wanted to head. I feel like there's a good segue in there somewhere. So this is, this season's about architecture and system layout and all that stuff. So what does architecture mean to you, Amos? That's a well-balanced problem. See, just as I have to explain it, is, is that was a pun based on the segue is well balanced. Anyway, <laughs> what does architecture mean to me? Well, ar- there's architecture in the small and in the large, right? So you have your your entire system or system of systems can can be architected and how they communicate, but architecture gets all the way down into the function level on how you decide to design functions and even name things and how they interact. So I it's system architecture is huge. And, and so I think we would need to find something system architecture to talk about. I don't know what level of architecture you're you know, thinking. Well, this is kind of the question is like, well, what does it mean? Like when, cause people interpret the question differently, right? Like, so in fact, we've had some really good answers in recent weeks. Um, I think we just had Dave Thomas on the show and Dave said that architecture is a metaphor. And he was actually taking it to mean specifically around the role of a software architect and what that person mm. does. Right. And so that was a completely unique take compared to 
several other takes that we've had that are more around like structure and like things like the changeability of things and design patterns and that kind of thing. So I think part of this is like, what, what do people mean when they say that? And it's so, and so what you're suggesting is that there's different levels of architecture and that you would have to know where it, what stratification you're talking right. about. Yeah. I think there's very different conversations. If you're talking about how do we design a s- system of disparate things talking to each other versus how do we design one of those things? And so to me, architecture is how you want to put things together and the the trade-offs that you have to make in order to, in order to build anything. And how does that yeah. differ from design? That's a tough question. I think that they're incorporated and it's really hard to separate them. But at the same time, design to me is is often the act of, of implementing an architecture. Yeah, you can design an architecture, but I, I kind of look at it as, as like civil engineers versus architects too, right? Is that an architect can draw whatever they want the, a building to look like. But when it comes down to it, that engineer goes to do it and you may not be able to do it exactly that way. Mm. Uh, because if I, if I build it, if I build this deck that's 60 feet out, no matter what type of material we put on it, it's going to be heavy enough that it's going to fall down, but that's what the architect wanted. So how can we hide a post or, or something like that to get as close to that ideal picture that the architect came up with as possible. Mm. And I think that's where a little bit of that creative thinking and design comes in. Um, I do believe that that comes in when you're, when you're thinking about an architecture too, but so design to me is the is more the creative part and then architecture is well i guess it's total I, now i said it's the total opposite of of what i started because i said architects <laughs> do that creative like beautiful drawing and then the engineer makes it happen if they can and then called that design i don't know uh mixing up my words let's just move on like i didn't say anything <laughs> all right no i think i think you talking is thinking out loud Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no one's totally, totally <laughs> <I don't>, legit. <laughs> and totally you can leave legit. it all in. I don't care. I'm, I'm stupid all the time. I think that's uh, how I learn. Right. Oh, yeah. You're, I, I like, you're I like the expert at stupid all the time. I, I like being the dumbest guy in the room. <laughs> Too bad, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, hilarious. Eric, you have real questions? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, we have, speaking of, uh, I guess, feeling being stupid, whatever, there's something in here. That's called uh, TFD, Type First Design. What is it and what are your opinions on it? Oh, I like typing in your show notes. That was fun. <laughs> I kind of look at this as, as a semi-link to the domain-driven design that that you all talked about. But, but Type First Development is, is sitting back and thinking of the types that you're going to be working with. And when I'm talking about types, I mean, even at the function level, like... I need a function that takes in this type and this type and and translates it to this other type. And so type first development would be like going through and kind of writing specs first, spending some time writing some specs and thinking like, does this really do everything that I need? It's more of like a thinking exercise just to get you you going. And then I think you go from that to TDD. Now, the tools in Elixir, you can't use Dialyzer without actually having the function body filled out. And let it tell you that, yes, your types are correct. That would be really cool. But since we can't do that, you, you do end up having to implement before you can use a tool like Dialyzer to help you. But even if you're not using Dialyzer, just going through that exercise of thinking, it gets, gets the brain going and, and you can get really far with just writing some, some types down and, and what the transitions of those types look like hmm. from one step to another. And I think that it leads to a lot of very functional design when you start to think in, in those types first, because you uh-huh. think you start to think, oh, well, I need this type to go from, I have a list of these types that need to go from here to there. So that means I need to create a function that goes from here to there. And then what if I can just inject that function? So this type is a list and then a function that goes from, I don't know, let's say I have a list of users that goes from a list of users to the highest permission level, um, uh, the permission levels of each user uh, to ultimately the end of the function, the return of the function may be the highest uh, author- author- authorization level of 
all the users in that list or something. I don't know. I'm just making up an example. It's probably not a great one, but all examples are flawed, terrible. Really so awful. As a, yeah. I guess, a follow-up question. Is this your announcement that you're starting to work in Haskell primarily? Hell no. <laughs> I find Haskell really interesting, but it hurts my brain to read it. Even after like writing some and, and working in it a little bit, not, I shouldn't say working. I never got paid playing with it a little bit is probably a better term. No real big projects or anything. I can read it and understand it, but it hurts my head uh, a lot. And then if you get into like, I'm going to call them real Haskell programmers, like the people who do this for a living, then all of their Haskell I would say is not domain driven design and you have functions that have a is the name of the function. No, actually the function names are usually pretty good, but the arguments are like X S D a (laughs) you're like, what the heck? I don't even know what goes in here. And they're like, it's because it can be any of these 10 different things. So we didn't give it a name. And I'm like, okay, that's great. I can't follow it. And the currying stuff when you just have like a big list of functions, but no inputs on one line. Sometimes it takes me a little bit to be like, okay, which order are these actually called in and which which ones are arguments to what? So no parentheses actually really helped me and Haskell got rid of them for the most part. Like people don't like to use a lot of parentheses in their Haskell, like around arguments to functions. I guess it's time to learn Haskell. It's now come up in so many episodes of this show. It, it almost invariably comes up on the show. You should try it out. Try it out. There's, it's, it's interesting. There's a good book that I have. a Well, I mean, I've read it, but a friend has read it and has, I don't know, influenced, tainted his elixir, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, and he's, he said it's good. It's it's gigantic. It's like a 1500 page PDF or something obscene. So I, I will find it and make sure that's in the show notes. You don't remember the name? I will in uh, the few minutes while Justice asks you a question and you answer and I search. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit more about uh, domain driven design because I, I still have not really gotten like a satisfactory explanation of what it even is. I have a hard time with a satisfactory explanation of what it is too. To me, most of what makes domain driven design work is is really just coming up with a common language with the other stakeholders in the project and trying to fit your code within the domain of their speak and their problems, because then as software evolves and your conversations with them evolve, you even speaking about code will use the same words and everything as they're using. And it allows you to make that translation a little bit better, but it also you know, this is why I think it's good with types is because if you start using those words that you come up with in domain driven design as the names of your types, it can it can really help that transition and that talking back and forth. And you can even I've done type first development with customers before just because we could pick these names and I'd say, oh, well, we have this user come in and and they become an admin you yeah. know, or something like that. This is really interesting because I do try to get the co- uh, the client on the same page as far as nomenclature with us as, as we go along. And the worst part is that they often change what they want something to be called like down the road. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. like, okay, well, I've already got database tables and stuff, so you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> but like, this is what it is. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. So how I deal with that frequently is like, like you have a lot like your, I'm trying to come up with a good example. I'm, I'm not. So you have your your software often has multiple users and multiple uh-huh. customers, and they might call the same thing by different terms, depending on on if they're uh, a banker or a car salesman, right? And you're you're doing car loan system. They uh-huh. may use different terminology when they're talking about the loan or, or the vehicle. One might call it a vehicle. One might call it a, a car. So that's where I think you get the context, right? You have, you have an overall context, which might be car loans. Mm -hmm. And then you have subcontext, which might be sales and I don't know, interest rates. I don't know enough about, about that industry. I should have picked a different one anyway. uh, So those are like the context that you have. Your application is 
car loans. That's your core context. And your subcontext might be authentication, authorization, oh. loan department, sales department, customer service, and all of these things like to run a car sales thing are every one of those individuals calls certain things that to you, they're the same thing, but to them, they use different terms. Mm -hmm. So that one section of your application can have a context module that goes through. So one person might, when you're talking about one section, let's say the salesman calls it a vehicle. And so you would say you would have like a sales dot get vehicle right mm -hmm. and then let's say the loan department maybe they deal with more than just vehicles so they call them assets and so now you would have loans or loan department dot get asset mm -hmm. and they might be pulling from the same bit database table or get asset might get complicated because it might pull a house or it might pull a vehicle yeah but to them it's just an asset this is and, great I'm a, yeah. i actually do this on one of our rails projects actually, which I know that sounds crazy because, but for, you know, we've got services and locations and organizations and they're all just resources and mm -hmm. you just get resources. Right. And that's how the client refers to it. Right. Is, I mean, sometimes they get more specific and they know that, like they, they know how it works. So mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes they get more specific, but when we're talking about it, it's always just resources. I like this. I mean, how did you kind of develop this conception of domain driven design? I think I was, doing it this way for a long time before mm -hmm. I heard the term. And then when people started talking about domain modeling and domain driven design, I remember watching Rob Martin, I think Elixir Conf, I'm going to say 2017. It's not Bob Martin, not uncle Bob, but Rob Martin talked about domain driven design. And I saw, I saw his talk. I didn't see it at the conference. I, I watched it online afterwards and I had seen you know, other talks and, and read a little bit. And every time I, I looked into it, I was like waiting for this big aha moment. And I was like, well, that's, that's just what I do. Like, what are you doing different? And then after a while I was like, okay, that's just how I do it. So, so I think that's how it really was, was like, I was already trying to get some sort of commonality between, between the clients, as I'll call them customers and myself to get to a, a common terminology because it made it a whole lot easier for my brain to then put like put that new functionality into an existing system if that system used the same terms as the person I was talking to. Yeah, it does seem like a lot a lot of these kind of concepts come out of like it's not like you invent domain driven design and then start practicing it. You've been practicing it and you come up with words to describe the practice and it ends right, up right. domain driven design. Very cool. Very cool. Do you want to talk a little bit about your company? You're the sure. boss man. Sure. I I don't know that I'd say that. We're tiny. We're tiny. I noticed that in your in your show notes you said like we do a lot of rescue projects. Yeah. Um I don't like that term because it says that we work with a lot of bad code and that's not necessarily true. Oh, I would say <laughs> I think it makes, I think it says that you're a hero and <laughs> you rescue people. <laughs> Sometimes it's really hard. A lot of it, a lot of it is more cultural often than than code. I mean, the code is bad, usually because of cultural issues within the company, mm -hmm. pushing too hard, stories w being very specific, not like I'm having this problem, solve it for me, work with me to solve it. But like, I want you to add a second password field to the page to confirm the password. Mm. And really what their problem is, is people keep forgetting their passwords. And right. so maybe we should look at password reset first because it's probably going to give you a password reset functionality is going to give you more bang for your buck than a second password field. Right. Right. So like that's a lot of it is there's the people who have been doing this for years aren't allowed to make those decisions and they get in this spot where they're always handed exactly what to do and then they just go jam it in. And that often also comes with hurry up and do this, hurry up and do this. This is small. How easy is this? Just get it done. And to be fair, I think a lot of times developers find it easier to just accept your marching orders than to push back and give like suggestions on better ideas. I, I don't know that I feel the same way. Fair enough. But I guess when I when I come in and I start talking to those people, these are the complaints that they give me. Mm -hmm, these mm -hmm. are the exact things that they say. Here are our problems. 
and we try to talk about it for years and, and like new people come in and they try to talk about it and then they just get sucked up into this culture and you just get burnt out of fighting and you're like, whatever, I'm just going to do this. I would say we do more team augmentation than rescue projects. I've been on some really cool, well-written projects that I've gotten helped out with. So it's and not, I, I, let not me jump in real just, quick. Oh my God, projects. Wait, let me jump in <laughs> and real quick. And the reason I wrote that line of helps rescue projects was I think at Lone Star, we were at the coffee place before the speaker's dinner. That was the like, maybe it was just this, that specific project you're talking about. But that's the, I don't know, some of the, I don't know, tone of what, of for the type of projects you do. It was what it sounded like. So, yeah. Oh, okay. No, it's, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I just, that wording is, I feel bad for clients if I use that word. Because it says your stuff is terrible. And somebody needs to throw you a lifesaver. But sometimes that's true. <laughs> so yeah, we, we oh, go in. <laughs> that is sometimes true. <laughs> we typically go into existing teams though and and just become part of the team, another program on the team, not an agile coach or I've I've heard like software coach or even I want to call it a software architect. I think that job actually is mostly terrible unless you're in such a giant system of systems that you need some people that are sitting way up above trying to figure out how all this works together Hmm. is that the software architect role is mostly just developers working together day to day to make a product that they can easily add new features to, right. But keep the same level of quality. So I want to defend the architect title because Eric is an architect. I'm a, I'm a technical ar- architect, which was the closest thing to not a manager that def- described the like thing that we were looking for my position well, to be. Plus, and I'm not saying anybody who has an architect title doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Plus, uh, oh, I want to justify it because okay. like the way I look at it, like I think of Dan, our director of development operations the same way. And I kind of use them both in the same way where I go to the architect when I've got like a big piece of functionality I need to develop. And I have a concept of how I think it's going to go. And I need it like validated. Like I need someone to say to me, yeah, that is a sane approach. And because you, I have more experience than you and I can kind of like say, yeah, Mm -hmm. that's a, that's a sane approach that you're about to take or ask questions and try to get me to a more sane approach or just strip demolish it and start over, over from scratch. So, cause like I use Eric and Dan in that way all the time. And I'm very happy to call them an architect if that is what they're doing. Cause in my mind, it's like, yeah, there's a feature it's big and they need to kind of architect the, the broad strokes, but I'm going to go in and actually implement it. And yeah. I think that's, that's fair. And I think, what you'll find too, as you go along is from project to project, even if you work with the same people Hmm. that it won't be the same person that you go to. That's right. And that's kind of where I, I often run into problems with the title and in a lot of companies that I end up going into the software architect. I, I, here's my, here's my quote sits so far from the keyboard that they don't know how it works anymore. And so they architect these solutions and you're like, that's not going to work. I once worked on a product like that where they had a, a BPM, I think is what it's called, business process modeling system. It's like drawing with code. It's so terrible. I hated it. But they kept telling us we had to use this BPM and the software architects. Like, this is how it is across the entire ecosystem. They probably said enterprise uh, is my guess. And when it came down to it, I was like, I, c- I can't do that because I have an XML file that comes in that is hundreds of gigs in size, single file. And you want me to push this XML file through this like web services layer that I draw together. It's going to fall down. Well, hopefully they're using a sax parser, right? <laughs> I always, what, was, what, are you guys, what are you guys maybe. talking about? Like, I start. You started to lose me at XML, but now what? <laughs> it's not that important the story. Uh, the big thing is, is in in that experience, is that architect got so angry that things weren't going the way that his architecture was designed that he ended up calling the people in who designed the BPM system and paying them for extra help to come and show me how it could be done. And they got there and 
they hand that I, I handed the XML to him. It was like, here's what he wants me to run through your system. And they're like, you can't do that. It's too big. I'm like, I know. <laughs> so he paid them to come over from Germany yeah. and, and sit down with me. And he paid them for like two weeks. And in the first 10 minutes, they were like, you can't do that. And then they went and helped other teams. You, you <laughs> should have gotten the reverse offer somehow and get a free trip to Germany. That would have been awesome. But <laughs> no, I run into architects like that. So sometimes I get a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth. Uh-huh. But at the same time, my thing is, is, is nothing against the architect title or uh-huh. someone who has, has been around long enough that maybe they are the person you should go to. But if, Tomorrow, I don't I don't know Eric's background, but if tomorrow Eric got put onto a prolog project doing machine learning, he may not have the actual experience to be an architect on that project. You're right. Yeah. Eric would explode if you put him on that project. <laughs> <laughs> would you have fun though? <laughs> Cause that's really what's important, right? Would you have fun? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, uh uh, and and yeah, but, but that's uh, I'm not against the arch- architect position per se. I would rather just say, you know what, give that guy some more money. He knows what he's doing. He's been around a while. I harp on it. I tell everybody, I'm like, raise your prices, whatever it is, just raise your prices because <laughs> you can't go wrong with making more money. Like it never goes wrong. It's that's never right. been a bad idea to make more money. Tell me about API architecture. This is the hot take anger yeah. talk. All right. Yeah. So so I think this gets down to a, this gets down to a lower <laughs> level. I'm going to talk about one specific thing that drives me batty and I see it in open source projects, I see it in internal projects, I see it everywhere is that you have an API that has a function that has some kind of switch. And if that switch inside of that function is only got it either works this way or that way but not not a third way, the then somebody passes in a Boolean as the switch, like true or false, like do this. And then it gets a true or false that, that really might mean they have permissions or they don't have permissions or something like that. And, and this thing's going to behave differently depending on that. Just can, can we never do that again? Booleans are a terrible, terrible switch. They contain no information outside of true or false. You don't know what it means. And then half the time in the code, somebody hard codes it to true anyway. And you're like, what the hell does that mean? In like a a database API, somebody will put true will return you validation errors. But if you pass it false, it doesn't do validations and just puts it right in the data. No, then pass in an atom that says validate or don't validate. Please just give it a name. Name that concept. I guess that's domain driven. Yeah. So it's <laughs> instead of magic numbers, it's magic booleans. Right. Magic numbers. Just as bad. Enums are enums. Not like there are too many things called enums. When I'm talking about enums right now, it's where you have like a name given to a number and and you have like a list of names and like the first one in the list is zero one two because and you store that in like your database or whatever those probably mostly come from days like hardware when if you're doing embedded systems you might end up having to do this but they do it to save memory and storage space but enums are that kind of enum is terrible terrible if you can avoid it never use them especially if you end up in some system that's distributed Mm-hmm. And then you have to pass those enums around and then somebody else changes something in their code base. And they're like, well, two to us means that you're an admin and three means that you're a super admin. And in your system, two means super admin and three means regular user and four is a salesman at the car lot. So this isn't going to work. And now you you have other. So, yeah, don't use those. I'll, I'll toss on. <laughs> uh, don't use bit masks either for pretty much the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and but if you're doing hardware, you're gonna have yep. to. So, yeah, yeah, don't, don't. And I've seen a lot of bit masks used for authorization. It is terrible. <laughs> like Maybe. four years yeah, after yeah. it's yeah. been developed, everybody's like, "What does bit number three mean?" And you're like, "Shit, I don't know." But half of our users have it set. I, what do we do? Yeah, I got, <laughs> I got this on one of my projects right now. In its defense, though. Everything else about that project is awesome. 
<laughs> I understand how people get there. I, I completely understand how people get there too. And and sometimes you need to do that for performance. Tell me how. Because I, I like almost anything that requires me to think more to understand it, I am like, eh, let's do the simpler thing. Right? Well, the, the problem is that often is that somebody didn't think enough up front. They didn't go on those walks like they're supposed to. They didn't they didn't try to come up with types like I think that they should should and think about the repercussions to it. But it does come down to, you know, like in that situation where you have a bit mask for for authorization is that maybe you originally were using some sort of list of atoms Mm. and that list gets huge and people can have 15 different properties and you have a million users now and stepping through all of their individual permissions is actually starting to be a performance problem Mm -hmm. when instead I could XOR it with a, a known bit mask and come up with true if this one bit is set or these three bits. And so you you can also start to get these really complex behaviors that are built up that run quickly. And so I understand how people get there. And I think that sometimes it might be necessary, but often it's done way early. Somebody's got some nice. Yeah. Who's got the cuckoo clock? I live next to an army base. Oh yeah. (laughs) That's that's five o'clock. It's Reveille. Yep. End of day. I'm ready to stand at attention on the side of the road. That's what you're supposed to do. You just stand there. Yesterday, they were dropping bombs like all day, and they were really, really loud and scary. Whoa. So, yeah. Aberdeen Proving Ground right next door. Oh, nice. Yeah. They drop like, a lot of bombs there. Lots of bombs. <laughs> it's like, and, it, and there's no like regularity to it. Like Sometimes you'll go for like a whole week without any bombs, and then other times it'll be like all day. Do they not do it at night, though? No, no bombs at night. Oh, Although nice. you do get sketchy, like heat lightning from over there. <laughs> at night. It's very sketchy, sketchy heat lightning. I live pretty close to Fort Leavenworth and then also close to Whiteman Air Force Base. So Fort Leavenworth, we have the big Chinook double propeller helicopters uh-huh. and they, they will like, I'm in Kansas city, but they will fly by my house all the time. I don't know where they're going. I think they're just out doing something like just flying around for practice, but they are super loud. And then we have the B2 bombers that every once in a while you get to see like the stealth bomber coming yeah. from Whiteman Air Force Base because that's where they are. And and they're like way quiet. <laughs> that's awesome. They're super quiet. We had a yeah. B2 fly over Indianapolis for the 500 two years ago. I don't know. It was super weird seeing this thing that was like flying overhead and that would just kind of twist like this and fly away from you. It's like gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, and they're, when they're low, they're not that quiet. Yeah. When they're low to the ground. Yeah. But they fly so much higher than those helicopters that so quiet. All right. So for our final question, while we're in the, the roasting section, uh, the hot takes, this is your chance. Do you have a hot take on Chris Keithley, your Elixir Outlaws? Co-host. Oh, I can't believe you'd put me in You're this position. compadre. This is, this is terrible. Roast him, King. Roast him, King. All right, here's what I have to say about Keith Lee. He's really opinionated, and I love talking to him. And, me too. <laughs> and, and sometimes he doesn't shut up. <laughs> he can be opinionated to the point that I'm like, whoa, man, calm down. Oh. <laughs> like, it's okay. And I, I have it a few times. I, uh, this is the best roast I can give is I've been at conferences and had people walk up to me and be like, you need to talk to Keith Lee. This is what he said on your podcast. And I'm like, you need to talk to Keith Lee. You got a problem with what he said? You think I can control him? Have you ever met Keith Lee? Like, mm. <laughs> Brilliant. Amos, thank you so much. Do you have any final plugs, asks for the audience where they can find you? That kind of thing. So we've been working on um, building up our blog at binarynoggin.com. Actually, we have a lot of posts that are more about thinking and learning and and those things than we do about technology. Mm. So check that out. I'm on Twitter and everything else at AdCron since we figured out where that came from today. I already spelled it once so we can move past. I'm, I'm that everywhere. I'm loud and obnoxious. And you can also find me, of course, on Elixir Outlaws, the second best Elixir podcast in the community. Well, you guys are full of magic. All I got is bullets. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amos. I will second the plug for the Binary Noggin blog. It's really terrific. I really enjoyed that piece on uh, thinking is greater than typing. Uh, it's a really, really top-notch blog, and I think you're just getting started over there. So go follow Amos King at his 
blog and Binary Noggin. Great company. That's it for this episode of Elixir Wizards. Thank you again to Amos King and my co-host, Eric Ostrich. Once again, I'm Justice Epen. Elixir Wizards is a smart logic podcast here at Smart Logic. We're always looking to take on new projects, building web apps and Elixir Rails. React infrastructure projects using Kubernetes and mobile apps using React Native. We'd love to hear from you if you have a project we could help you with. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast player. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. So add us on all of those. You can also find me personally at Justice Epen on Twitter or Instagram or wherever. And Eric at Eric Ostrich. And join us again next week on Elixir Wizards for more system and application architecture. Mic drop. Thank you.